Good evening, and, and you're very warm welcome to this evening's event. I am Professor David Mba, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Knowledge Exchange at the University of the Arts, London. It is my privilege to welcome Yinka Shunibare, CBE, to the University of the Arts, London, to learn about his vision for sharing respect, knowledge, and cultural debates between artists, curators, academics, practitioners, local professionals, all internationally. I am proud to launch this keynote event for the university's research season, a thought-provoking program taking place throughout the month of March that engages critically with themes of earth and equity. During the month long program of public events, the university's six colleges, four research institutes, nine research centers will be hosting events to showcase the rich diversity of the university's research with a special focus on the theme, earth and equity, integrating environmental and racial justice, number two. A theme we started with in 2021 and have decided to continue owing to the vast myriad of work being undertaken in this area at the University of the Arts London. With more than 57 events, 90% open to the public, you'll be able to hear about the projects, platforms and people working to progress environmental and racial justice across the university referencing Black Lives Matter and racial justice, climate change, COVID-19, decolonization, intersectionality, sustainability, and social design. Today's keynote event is the sixth episode of the Decolonizing Lens, an ongoing series of conversations led by Professor Mark Seeley and organized by the Photography and the Archive Research Center. The decolonizing lens is situated against a context of great social, cultural, and economic change, and invited speakers to consider key areas of debate for activists, theorists, and creative practitioners. Presented by Mark, the series takes its name from his seminal 2019 book, Decolonizing the Camera, Photography in Racial Time. His latest book, Photography, Race, Rights, and Representation is published by Lawrence Wishart on the 15th of March, 2022, tomorrow actually, and launched tonight. So today's event titled Hosting Ideas for Progress will take the form of an in, of an in conversation with Yinka Shunibare and Professor Mark Seeley and will be chaired by Professor Pratab Rogani. So I'll very briefly introduce Yinka, Mark, and Pratab. Firstly, Yinka Shonibare CBE is a British Nigerian artist living in the United Kingdom. His work explores cultural identity, colonialism, and post-colonialism within the contemporary context of globalization. Yinka's work is truly multidisciplinary, encompassing sculpture, textiles, painting, social practice, photography, and film. It is his emphasis on education and the transfer of skills and knowledge between disciplines and practitioners that makes his presence here with us today so valuable. Professor Mark Seeley, OBE, who's a director of Autograph ABP, is interested in the relationship between photography and social change, identity politics, race, and human rights. He has been director of Autograph APB since 1991. Mark is a professor of photography rights and the representation and a core member of the university's photography and the archive research center. Professor Pratab Rugani is an award-winning writer and documentary filmmaker with a particular focus on brokering dialogue in contested spaces. He is a specialist in practice-based research and professor of documentary practices at the London College of Communication, where he's also the Associate Dean of Research. So 
A very warm welcome from me again, and I'm going to now pass on to Professor Pratab Rugani. Pratab, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, David, and very, very warm welcome to our several hundred participants from many different time zones. Really, really delighted to have you here for our keynote event. Um, it's a great pleasure to set the framework for this conversation. I won't say a lot more about the eminent bios of um, Mark and Yenka, um, but just I want to say something about structure and then hand over to, to their presentations. Um, so Mark, uh, Professor of Photography at UL, UAL, will be in conversation with Yenka. Um, Mark will give a short presentation, followed by Yenka's. And as they do this, they've asked me to help steer and then to guide the Q&A. As we're going through sort of following their insights, I'd really encourage all of us to take a note. Um, if you spot the thing that you really want to grapple with, you might um, be very moved by something, inspired by something, or you might be really struggling with the way that some of the really delicate and, and um, some of the challenging issues really around decolonial questions strike you. Um, we want this to be as open a space as possible. And please don't feel that you need to be an academic or an expert or a curator to intervene. Just hold on to those um, perceptions, insights, um, put them in the chat and then we'll, when we get to 6.30, which will be the end of the um, uh, initial discussion between Mark and Yenka, put all of those ideas in and I'll help field them and see if we can get as many of those across to um, Mark and Yenka as we can in that last half an hour and then we finish our, as advertised at seven. So um, it, it's a real delight to uh, introduce Mark um, and Yinka, they're two highly respected practitioners, curators, makers, and in their, the trajectory of their own work, um, their paths have met and touched, and they have um, been really significant in, in un, unfolding um, a much broader way of looking at what I'm going to let them describe coming, coming soon in terms of um, cultural difference and approaches uh, to the decolonial and the intersection with race and many other things. Um, so they have already have a strong relationship in the way that they approach works from very a very different very different perspectives. And I just want to give one example of that, which is that their their joint and early appreciation of the work of the great visual artist Rotomi Fanny Kiodi, recognizing his work, uh, curating, promoting, helping a deeper critical and visual understanding of it. And in one we now preparation session, they talked a little bit about Rotomi as helping invent a new cosmology. And it's something that I think they're very much that phrase could very much be applied to the way they work. So I'm going to hand over to Mark first and to help lead us in this cosmology. Thank you. Well, <laughs> uh, well, listen, thank you, uh, Patel, and thank you, David, for the introductions. It's really um, a pleasure to be here tonight, especially in this context within and across UAL, and also to, of course, be joined by Yinko, kindly you know, agreed to have this conversation at an incredibly busy time in his work practice. But it is pressing and it is kind of urgent, I suppose, that we keep the kind of conversations alive and keep things boiling and keep the um, agenda moving along this, I suppose, um, I'm hoping a real time of change. I really wanted to come to uh, the university because I'm interested in the now of colonizing institutions, their machines and methods of operation and how they've created restrictive and all consuming and often dehumanizing borders. I'm interested in these borders they're not just geographic, they're racial, they're sexual, they're epistemic, they're ontological, religious, and aesthetic, linguistic, and of course, national. Borders are the interior roots of our modernity, which equals coloniality, and the consequences of international law and global linear thinking. These confined spaces of colonial control create the perfect conditions in which the politics of cultural, cultural erasure can thrive. I'm hoping that we can, through a process of what I can only describe as a form of jazz, begin the delinking process that peels away at the rotten hard skin, 
that sits on the body of culture and allows us and allows for different ideas to flourish and different voices to be amplified. The role I guess I'm interested in developing is aimed at the intersectional discursive spaces that focus on post-colonial and decolonial practices and theories. I'm hoping to continue interrogating and reimagining the historical and contemporary nature of photography's interculturality. I will be operating through the existing Photography and Research Center and hopefully opening it up and developing it further. And emerging, and, and I want to work with emerging other channels within the institutions. My intention is to expand and encourage research practice networks into spaces of making and thinking which is why I'm so interested in where Yinka Shonabari is at the moment with his projects. My vision embraces creative, innovative, curatorial, historiographic history, work across photography and film practices in their micro and macro forms. The goal is to build on well-established partnerships and academic and legal institutions, artists, arts organizations, and museums worldwide so as to develop scalable research-based projects that have social change and diversity built in. My vision engages directly with the global crisis we're facing concerning the human condition, while emphasizing the necessity for an inclusive rights-based practice. The book published, the new book published by Lawrence and Wishart, which is officially launched tomorrow, covers over 30 years of critical writing it's not bound by any orthodoxy, but aimed at encouraging a form of radical praxis. It's a tool, I hope to signpost some ways of thinking that might be of use. Yinka Shonabari is also someone that signposts different ways of being, and it's great to be in dialogue with him as part of this new journey I hope we're all on. Thank you, and over to Yinka. Thank you. Just before we um, start with Yinka, I just did want to read a little bit more fully to, to introduce him appropriately. So Yinka's international multidisciplinary practice explores colonialism and post-colonialism within the context of globalization. In 2019, he set up the Yinka Shonibari Foundation, a UK registered charity dedicated to facil facilitating international cultural exchange and supporting creative practices with residencies, collaborations and, educa collaborations and education projects. It gives a platform for creative development and knowledge sharing between established and emerging practitioners and supports international partnerships between artists, engineers, designers, collectors, architects, agriculturists and ecologists. Yinka's vision behind the foundation is to support the development of new work and ideas to foster mutual understanding of cultural differences as we break down traditional barriers of privilege and wealth to build access and create new pathways to education, to forge new networks and a resilient cultural infrastructure that will enable the next generation to thrive, not just survive. His new artist residency spaces in Lagos and Ijebu in Nigeria will open later this year. Thanks, Yinka. Well, <laughs> well, thanks for um, thanks for having me. And um, um, well, Mark, so over to you. Yeah, I mean, Yinka, one of the things, it's it's great to be in the same space with you. And I also just wanted to kind of join the dots back across some of the things we've been talking about in the past. I know that really that um, part of your thinking, if we just go on a little, if we just take people back a little bit, has been kind of resetting ideas in history. Who was active, what they were doing, what the key players were, how knowledge systems work. And I know that one of the things that you've been uh, investigating over time is this idea of the a critical view of the enlightened thought and how ideas have progressed in time and in history. And we've had a conversation, I think we had began a conversation something like 1995 during the Africa 95 um, season, which was uh, another one of those all-inclusive festivals 
um, at a very quiet little dinner and you showed me a postcard of you performing, I remember it well, a really raw, tiny little postcard that you pulled out and you, you, you dressed up and performed this historical character. And I thought, Yinga, we have to do this <laughs> through the lens of autograph. We have to make this thing real. We have to make this thing really big because it was just a, a complete radical intervention with the history of painting and the history of how power and portraiture works. And I think we, uh, we spoke for about 18 months after that. And you were also at a really important uh, point in your career. You were just about to join Stephen Friedman Gallery. And we made, this, we made this piece of work, we autographed, commissioned this piece of work through this idea that literally came off the back of a, almost the back of a small postcard. And I wondered if you wanted to just help us through the thinking behind a piece like Ethnic in 1997. Yes, so um, I think it's very important to paint the uh, picture of context for people um, to try and understand where, um, you know, artists, artists of color were at that time and what the climate was like. Um, there was the exhibition that happened at the White Chapel Art Gallery, uh, Seven Stories of Modern Art in um, Africa. Um, there was the exhibition organized by Rashid Durin at the Haywood Gallery called The Other Story. And then there was a third text magazine uh, by Rashid Durin. Now, I know, of course, we also must mention the Black Art Movement, um, Eddie Chambers, Keith Piper, Sonia Boyce, uh, Lubena Himid. Um, you know, and many, many other, many other artists. And then there's Black Audio Film Collective, um, you know, John Akonfra, uh, David, uh, and so on. So that was a time when, um, you know, most of us were not actually visible in mainstream spaces. And commercial galleries were actually saying they could not sell. They wouldn't be able to sell the work of Black artists, see, you know. Um, so most of us ended up relying on organizations like Autograph, um, like Iniva, you know, was also created, um, you know, which, you know, I'm sure, you know, you know the story of, of all of that. And so in that context, I was actually looking over at um, American artists and looking at what they were doing. So there were people like David Hammonds, uh, working at the time, and also, you know, in the from the feminist perspective, there are people like you know Cindy Sherman also working. So performance or performing the body uh, was central to practice. Then, of course, before that, Rotimi Fani uh photographs, and so in practice, uh, we were all reading you know, French critical theory, you know, deconstruction. We were reading Derrida, uh, Lacan, Baudrillard. And so what was important at that time was to, was the deconstruction of these grand narratives so that, you know, we were in effect occupying so-called spaces that we were not meant to occupy and doing that deliberately. So the thinking behind, uh, so the postcard that you mentioned was um, for a show that actually I did in Hammersmith. And then that was the postcard that I uh, used. And so I did the first version of this work then. And as it happens, actually that first version is in the first uh, article published about my work in Freeze Magazine that was written by um, Corbina Mercer. Yeah, at the time. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I, I produced uh, this work because given my own artistry education and the kind of, um, you know, paintings made in the 18th century, whenever you saw a black person in those paintings, they were either in some kind of secondary role, they were the valet and, you know, you would never see us portrayed, um, you know, in a position of um, empowerment. So in other words, our agency historically has been removed. And so you will see throughout my practice, 
the point of my practice, I mean, there's a bit of parody there. There's a bit of humor, there's a, there's a bit of satire, but it's also essentially about um, black agency and, re and taking control of the way in which we have been represented throughout history. And so that's kind of the point of those kind of performative um, you know, uh, works and the point of you know, taking that space of power and interrogating or, you know, um, uh, that space. So that's the point of this, um, you know, of this image. And then, you know, when I talk about taking control and taking control of the narrative. And so in the spirit of deconstructing the grand narrative, I started to actually look at painting itself and the history of painting. And so this is a painting by Gainsborough. And this painting is at the National Gallery. And you will notice in that painting, you know, it's a, you know, a wealthy middle-class couple um, in front of their estate. Now, of course, you know, there's a bit of um, gallows humor here because they've been, you know, their heads have been taken off, uh, you know, um, as it happened during the French Revolution. And, you know, but the trappings of their wealth. So, you know, you walk into the spaces, you know, you walk into the National Gallery, uh, you walk into the Tate, I mean, the whole kind of financial system. So the legacy of enslavement is all around us and we still occupy those spaces, um, you know. And so my own kind of way of um, protest, if you like, or quiet protest is to actually start to interrogate, you know, uh, representation itself and also interrogate history. So this is um, why this work, you know, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews uh, without the heads was, was done. So the practice- Inca. Yeah. Inca, can we just come, there's a key word there, which I'd just like to bring us back to is this idea of agency. Yes. I think, it, I think it's, uh, it's really, it's, it's, and we've talked about people like Rashida Reen, we've talked about the Institute of International Visual Arts, Autograph and various, um, various franchises that were set up, which was set up. I think a key word that threads through most of those institutions, some of them are now, or some of those individuals, Isaac Julian, Sankofa, et cetera, was this idea that there would be an agent, would, would be to encourage this idea of agency. And I think it's also pretty critical to think about that, the, the, the development of that agency in that period of kind of like just about the beginning of the Blair years, where things were gonna get better and also possibly within the context of uh, the kind of highlighting of the kind of YBA movement and the kind of Britpop, et cetera, because- Cool, cool Britannia. Kind of, cool, cool Britannia. And in a funny kind of way, a lot of, the work, a lot of the work that's actually being unfolded here is a kind of unlocking, if you like, a kind of promotion of, of black agency, for want of a better word, or an idea, and a promoting, if you like, of an unpicking of all those things that were making Britain cool. There's, I think there's, I think there's more than irony within these places. I think there's a kind of sense of uh, deep critical kind of underpinning, which pulls apart, if you like, the infrastructure, almost the, almost the kind of artistic historical infrastructure of these institutions by daring them to engage with the ideas that you're presenting. So in terms of people like, uh, in talking to say someone like Stuart Hall, the late Stuart Hall, he would often use words like wager when discussing your work. Think about it as a kind of gamble, a gambit, an idea, a card on the table, and it's up to the institutions to pick it up if they dare. Well, no, uh, well, absolutely. And in fact, you know, when you talk about uh, institutional interventions or public interventions, so, you know, it's actually quite common now to have works on the underground, but you know that this is actually my first public art piece of works. I, I made this work in collaboration with Inva, and there were uh, huge posters on the London Underground, over 40 stations. And at the time, that was quite radical to put a black man at the center of London like that and create this kind of historical fiction. And the work was actually quite confusing for people because some people thought that, you know, did that character actually exist? You know, who was that person? And this is a work I made as a way to remake um, Hogarth's um, Rake's Progress, 
uh, but I set it deliberately in Victorian times and I inserted, so the dandy at the center, you know, is, is myself uh, in that image. And, you know, it was a time when, quite honestly, I mean, I was tired of seeing negative images of, um, of us everywhere, um, you know, crime images on the news, um, you know, historically also. So, and I wanted a way to, I didn't want to make those interventions on the margins. I wanted, I've always wanted to make my interventions in the mainstream and also right in front of the, um, you know, of the British public. And um, so if we go to the next images. Yeah, so, you know, so basically uh, this is a dandy who kind of, it just has a, a life of leisure. You know, I, he's wealthy. Um, he's not, you know, he, he's got valets, he's got, he's got, he's got maids. But in a, it's a kind of satire. It, it's not necessarily encouraging that kind of subservience of others, but it's sort of looking at history and then turning it, uh, you know, turning it on its head. But it's interesting though, Yinka, isn't it? Because the Rake's progress, he's a kind of flawed character as well, isn't he? Yes, he's a flawed character, but it, Hogarth essentially was kind of moralistic in that. But I, I decided to actually do uh, not go the moral angle and to just kind of leave it open to just have this in the way that Oscar Wilde um you know had the it was really critical of the establishment because of his own you know sexuality and his um Irish um background uh, but he used his wit and his style to kind of critique uh the establishment and uh, so this is a black man who dares to be a dandy in the face of the establishment, you know, and so that's kind of what this is, um, you know, what this is about. That's Could I, um, sorry, can I just observe something there between both of you, Mark and Yenka, that in different ways, I think what, what you're doing in, at that historical moment as well is insisting that the representation of, in this case, black people cannot continue in this sort of victim um, scenario and the desire both to look into the structures and then reinvent something gesture towards an, uh, other ways of representing and of being no uh, yes absolutely i mean you know this is uh, the story of empowerment not uh, victimhood um, as might be desired by others but you know, this kind of approach is very commonplace now, but you, you see these images and they were made in 1998. So um, the, the impact in 1998 and 2022, you know, quite, quite different, you know, um, so. I think so actually, Yink, and I think one of the key concerns which was, was running through Autograph at the time was, all, well, from its deep, within its DNA, was always that question of how do you change or reset the narrative in terms of the visual social position of the black subject within popular culture, within visual culture. And these moments, and put within the public realm especially, these moments were really transgressive in a, in a step towards that. And I think it is important to remember the radical nature of the type of agency that was being given to the black subject through this work. It wasn't just about flipping the story or replacing it was about asking people to really rethink the nature of that black subject in the frame. A lot of this was attempted to be done through documentary photography work, people like Van Lee Burke, for example, based in Birmingham, but it wasn't having that work wasn't having the same kind of exposure as this work was having within the public art in the underground, for example. It just wasn't it just wasn't amplified in that way it wasn't in the face of people and it wasn't causing that confusing sense of destabilizing destabilizing work that this kind of agency was giving the audience to think about no absolutely and this work i mean it was all over the press you know mainstream press which is exactly the strategy which is what i wanted you know um i didn't really want to produce my work on the margins i and um and you know, at the time, I was, um, you know, kind of, in, in a funny way, I managed to straddle 
the kind of black art scene and the white British mainstream art world, you know, because I was in sensation at, at uh, the Royal Academy. Um, you know, I was in Saatchi collection and I was considered, um, you know, a YBA, but, but of course, you know, I didn't really consider myself that because I felt essentially that my work had a kind of political edge that was really quite sort of um, deliberate. You know, um, okay, so can, can we go to the, to the next one? Uh, and then, you know, I created, I was also very interested in Oscar Wilde. And um, so this is the picture of Dorian Gray, um, which is really um, a series of images about mortality. Um, and then again, it's, it's that thing of saying, you know, culturally, because you, the other thing that we haven't talked about much here um, is the, the idea of appropriation and who is allowed to appropriate what. Now mm -hmm. we know that historically, um, you know, black culture has always been appropriated in music, in the visual arts, um, and also, you know, appropriation is a kind of, you know, it's about the rites of passage. Who has the right or the freedom? You know, the whole kind of modernist artist from Picasso to Matisse. Uh, modernism itself was based on reinventing or looking at African art, you know, Dada, Surrealism, Man Ray, you know, with another kind of photography, you know, uh, historical, which in which African imagery has been kind of appropriated. So in terms of my own sense of self within the world, I feel that I can also equally, uh, we're going to talk about equality of power. I can take inspiration from anywhere and appropriate. And I do that deliberately across my practice, you know, which is about power relations. I think that, I think there is that undercurrent, isn't there, of, of wanting to take power, Yinka, constantly through, through the work. It's not enabling, there, there is there is a centering, isn't there? A, a self, not there's a physical self-centering, but there's an ideological self-centering, which breaks down. I've always thought with when I've saw your work or we've talked about your work on, on you know on, on occasion about the idea of not waiting for somebody to do that self-centering for you, but to own that space in and of your in in and in and of your own context. Yeah, no, I mean, abs you know, absolutely. And it's about, you know, um, our freedom to take what we want and feel free doing that, you know. Uh, so can we go to the next image? So we'll just go through um, those Story. images. Yeah. And then next. And then the next. But, you know, ironically, I'm actually, it's not my photography that I'm known for, you know, even though I have done photography and film. <laughs> But I'm, I'm, I'm actually better known for my costume pieces. Um, and I don't know, you see, I don't know why, but um, so basically this is a piece called Scramble for Africa. And this is a recreation of the Berlin Conference uh, in the 19th century when Africa was basically divided up by European countries without actually asking Africans if, if they thought that, was, that would be okay with them. And of course, consequently, a lot of the uh, conflict you find within African countries are still based on those artificial um, divisions and those artificial uh, countries that are kind of created artificially without actually asking the, uh, the residents if that's what they would like. If they, you know, they didn't ask in Nigeria if, um, you know, if people wanted to be in the same country, um, they just drew a line in the sand and said, there you go, that's your country. You know, so, um, and I think, uh, so it's kind of tackling some of those uh, historical problems that have actually led to some of the difficulties we have today. And, you know, I am known for using um, African textiles in my work. Now, the history of those textiles, actually, I mean, I'll say a little bit about, you know, how I came to start using them for those who don't know. I, Yinka, I just wanted I just wanted to interject because this is one of the few pieces actually the few 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 sculptural pieces that does talk about I've always been obsessed with this moment in time 
as a kind of re, you know, people talk about great, great, great global shaping contextual political moments. I've always been, the scramble for Africa has always become like a comic, um, a comic line, but it is one of the world's defining episodes in terms of what shaped the kind of present and also how we think about the past. And I've always been, the times that I've been in Berlin, I've always thought it, it, there should, they, I'm really surprised that there isn't a, a kind of monument to this, to this, to this incredible occasion, which had every, every global power involved in it from Russia to America, to Turkey, all the empires came together and kind of feasted on, on this space. And yet somehow, that's what I mean by cultural erasure, unless we produce pieces of work like this, the memory of that kind of like political, which is not that long ago, actually, it's, uh, it's not a million years ago. It's like, it's like 150 years ago or something. It's, it's still the resonance of it, as you rightly say, is still being played out, pl played out in our present, whether it's the, whether it's the, the wars in Sierra Leone, the kind of material extraction, I really don't want to play a piece of work like this down is what I'm basically saying. I don't want to play, I know, I know you're no. not going to, I really, I really want to be able to center this has been a really, a, a really important, you know, diasporic African artists making a kind of intervention and having a conversation with a contemporary white cube space that throws fundamentally back into its face, the ideas of coloniality, extraction, power and empire. Yeah, no, I'm absolutely. And, you know, the, um, well, you see, those power relations, funny enough, also have something to do with the formation of our own identities. So the identities we give ourselves. Uh, so, for example, post independence Africa, you know, people started to wear this. Um, uh, you know, batik fabrics uh, as, as a way of not identifying as a Westerner. So they were kind of bold statements at the reappropriation of those, those fabrics. But the interesting thing about them, of course, we know that they are Indonesian influenced fabrics produced by the Dutch and then sold back to West Africa. And so, and then of course, you know, I went to Brixton market and I started talking to them in the shop, you know, um, about about the fabrics, you know, and I was told the fabrics are, you know, are Indonesian inspired fabrics produced by the Dutch and then sold back to Africa. And, you know, those kind of trade routes, it's very interesting that those histories are also carried on our bodies, um, even though, you know, we've uh, appropriated those fabrics and they've become in a way a batch of um, African identity, if you like. But I also find those kind of, those kind the way that history, if history doesn't actually leave your body, it does not go away from you. And yeah. that your, you know, the way you present yourself also are markers of your own history. And yeah, the first thing, I prefer to think about it, it's like history won't leave you alone. You feel as though you can shed the skin of its time but it's never far away and it's always, always in the present. And I, and I think about that through, through the stuff that goes on outside of the frame of making, if you like. I'm very interested, as you well know, in terms of not just what we look at, but all of the, like the politic of describing the route to those cloths on the black body. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really important. People know the kind of, uh, the kind of the weird, wonderful narrative of how this African cloth becomes an invented kind of colonial discourse. Exactly. <laughs> it becomes, exactly. It becomes a, that becomes a kind of, if, if you like, a kind of an internalized signature of rejecting the West. <laughs> yes, exactly. But Which then, in, so in a way that this kind of embodies both the ability to look into the shadow of history and to invent something broader, in this case, fabric, color, enacting, embodying something different, something you, go, you both have in common in different ways. Yes, but then you see that's, in this case, it's also further complicated and hybridized by actually making Victorian suits out of them. Exactly. <laughs> and then, and then of course, the beheading and the crazy gestures across the, across the table, which add to a kind of like, you want to, when I first saw this piece, I wondered who was sitting where as well. 
<laughs> yes. You know. So it's like, which, which part of the table is that? I wondered where people like Leopold were in the making of this, uh, in the making of this narrative, which of course, it throws up all, all of those questions. But also power. absurdity, absurdity and yeah. humor is also, you know, it's a very um, important thing. You know, like satire is a very important way uh, of dealing with some of these issues because there is a sense in which one is expected as somebody of African origin to be angry, to be the victim. You know, it just seems to be what's expected. But mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, right from the start of my career, I, I, I've always been, well, well, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm not giving you that. I'm not gonna be your, you know, I'm not gonna be your star, star, star victim. <laughs> you know, and um, yeah. but that's that that's a difficult one, isn't it? That that place of um, because in many ways it's almost that the I would say one of the things that uh, the nineties in particular, you read the, the 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 criticism of the work. It's interesting to see the map in terms of the um, the divisions that have been been played out. But the criticism of the work was always it's either too didactic or it's just too angry or you're making posters of protest. That's how everything was being cast aside. And there's almost like a new scramble for, well, we're jumping the gun a little bit here. There's almost like a new scramble for Africa now because the cultural institutions realize that they can't have an international collection without, without putting in contemporary African artists or historical African artists in that space. So the price of this, the price of this absence is phenomenal now, right? Well, yes, but then quite right too. I actually think that we are um, absent in major collections and actually to actually fill the gap that should be filled, it'll probably take the next hundred years because we, we are blatantly and obviously absent and yet where we are embodied in every wealthy stately home or every grand neoclassical architecture around London. You know, our sweat, our blood built those things. So we I should- love the, I, I, love, I love the idea that there is a kind of, uh, that, that, that we remind people of that space, that it's not a kind of, uh, it, it's, it's not some kind of in, entitled piece of liberal um, gift to allow us into these institutions. No, absolutely there is, not. There is, that there is absolutely fundamentally no institution without that blood sweat and bodied in spaces. You are ingrained in that space. And we I think once, the lights of London. Once, once, that penny, once that penny drops, there's a, kind of, there's a kind of different kind of radicality can emerge, right? It's not, it, it's not about entitlement. It's about simply understanding that you're present whether you like it or not. Absolutely. You know, the whole financial banking system, you know, what was a large part of it was based on enslavement of people. You know. Yeah, I think it was Carol Phillips in the mid late 80s who just as an aside observed that every third or fourth story of um, London financial institutions was literally the wealth of the triangular slave trade, let alone all of the other colonial endeavours. So it's, it's there it embodied, as you say. Yes, no, absolutely. Go on, Iga. I, I'm also keen because I'm, I'm, I'm very mindful of time to talk about how film works within your practice in, in particular and how the idea of the body and performance and also incorporating ballet kind of came, came, came into the fore and what the politics of that kind of critical conversation, because there's still an awful lot of work to be done around, if you like opera, ballet, the black body inside of that space, the performative nature of space and place. So if we can maybe drill in a little bit into, you know, works like, works like Umbalo, that would be fantastic. Yes, so um, this is a series I did on a residency in Stockholm. And I was in, at the time there was the Iraq war. And I was actually looking at, um, so the king um, at that time in Sweden was, um, you know, so we're talking, um, you know, 18th century. Um, he was fighting wars in Russia at the time. And while his people were starving, so it was decided then to assassinate him at the ball. And so I recreated this ball and I recreated the, 
that kind of dance, but I mixed um, ballet with contemporary dance in the film and um, some kind of abstract uh, movements. And so that's the film, but, but the, the film itself was a way of actually talking about war uh, generally and the impact at the time of the Iraq war. Uh, but I did not want to uh, be literal about that. So I, I then went to Verdi's opera, uh, Umbado Mascara, which was a recreation of the assassination of the king. And, but then the, 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 the issue of gender also came into it at the time. So I changed uh, the king to a woman and I changed the assassin to a woman as well. And I kind of wanted to also look at the history of cinema and how the lead roles tend to be, for the most part, you know, masculine. And so again, this was made 2004. So a lot of the kind of gender related issues, um, you know, were, you know, around, but not as mainstream as, um, you know, as they are now, um, you know, so I was exploring that in, in this, uh, you know, in this project. And so those are the kind of stills. And also the film didn't actually have any sound. Uh, I mean, there was the sound of bodies, but not, not music as such. And um, I don't know, Mike, did you see the film when it was, it was, I think it was nominated for the Turner uh, yeah. Prize. So it was, um, yeah, so you, you know, so it was mostly the weight and the sound and the breathing um, of, um, of people that you could hear, not, not music. Yeah, I want to also move, uh, move us on to the, um, where we, I, I can't believe where time is going, it's going so quickly. I'm very keen, of course, to talk about two things. And I want to keep the word agency alive in our conversation. I also want to keep the, the sense of the project, the, the foundation, the building and the, and the desire to get the foundation off the, off, off the ground. The work that you've done in London about sharing the spaces with artists and collecting. Yeah. So if we can talk about um, what the, the, the ideas towards, uh, look, I, really, really, I think it's really important for me to put on the table that I think the, you know, the, the sense of generosity that you've had to, an, uh, to be in dialogue with people, with dialogue with history, dialogue with contemporaries, dialogue with the past, dialogues with both, you know, the black art practices and the white cube spaces, the space that you've sat between, in between these entangled corners, have meant that there's been a, a sense of uh, generosity, if you like, in terms of being open to having people and hosting people and hosting works and collecting and sharing that space. And I think, you know, what you did in London with the kind of foundation development, if we can talk about the genealogy of that, the time and the space of that, that would be most useful. Okay, can we move the slide on? And then move, move, move those on and on again. I'm just okay. going to talk about these because I do I do love the kind of the, very quickly the context of that. Yeah, but let's 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 get to the foundation place. Okay, like well, move move on, move on, on, and on. Yeah, yeah. that's it. So there we go. So this is um, my studio in London. And so I decided, uh, I think about 11 years ago to, um, because at the time, you know, London property was getting very expensive. Um, when I was a younger artist, you know, we used to take over a number of project spaces, just empty offices. And this was in the eighties. And, you know, many of us took over warehouses and we made shows. And I mean, the most famous one was you know, the show that Damien Hurst did, but actually we were all doing it then, just taking over empty spaces and, and, and uh, working. So I created guest projects and I would give, uh, and this was all art forms from dance to performance to, um, and, you know, artists would take the space for a month. And the idea was to provide a platform for artists to fail, um, to, you know, to experiment and try things out. Um, 
I supported a, a theater company called Tango um, Theater Company, an Afro-Caribbean theater company. Um, they've gone on to do great things. You know, I gave them space to practice, to rehearse. Um, and, you know, and I like to see work just being shaped without people worrying about whether they can sell the work or not sell the work. So purely a platform for um, experimentation. And, um, you know, and then after doing that, so can we go to the next image? Then I decided to actually form a foundation and then make the project more international. Now, the reason for doing that is that, you know, the movement historically has always been from the South to the North. Um, you know, many people from the Caribbean, from Africa come here. Um, I feel that prejudice by and large is based on ignorance. It's based on people not having um, equal uh, cultural exchange. And so I decided that actually I want to create a platform for international exchange where people can, you know, artists of all art forms, all disciplines can actually go to Nigeria um, and, you know, start dialogue with the artists locally and they can make work. And so the point is to, to create a space for research. Um, and also I wanted to do that on two sides. I wanted it to be rural and I wanted it to be urban. And I also, given the context of um, climate change and you know, the ideas around food sustainability, um, I felt that it would be nice to actually have, uh, you know, to do something within conservation and agriculture. So this is the residency space that we um, that we built in in Lagos. So um, this building has a, a gallery slash workspace, um, three bedrooms for residents. Um, you know, and they can they will stay for three months. And we our first residents will be curators uh, from Germany, and they will start. Uh, I think they start at the end of April. And they, um, you know, I've just been to Lagos to launch the space. Um, and um, we will also always have artists from Africa and the African diaspora. And so that's the courtyard and the building is based on the courtyard uh, buildings of, you know, Yoruba architecture mixed with uh, modernist architecture from Le Corbusier. And um, this is the courtyard. So this is an event that we uh, we had. So the courtyard is essentially a performance space. And so artists will be able to come out and perform. And the, uh, the building was designed by a black British female architect called um, um, Elsie Owusu. And that's the, the last building, that's a Lagos building. And uh, on the farm, we have a farmhouse for artists. And on the, so artists who go to Lagos will be able to go to this farmhouse. The farmhouse was built with uh, 40,000 40, handmade bricks uh, made locally from soil that was actually excavated from the site. And um, so, you know, where, because I know, you know, you, you've been talking about earth and sustainability. So that's what we're trying to contribute towards. And we have many crops. We have 54 acres, which is approximately about 54 football fields. And um, those are some of our greenhouses. Uh, the landscape is really beautiful. The space, the farm is two hours out of Lagos. Um, there's a village just at the entrance of the farm. And, you know, we're providing employment there uh, we have a number of crops uh, and uh, we have 12,000 fish. We have fish ponds. We have, uh, you know, three, uh, we do free range, uh, free range chickens. We have um, cassava, maize, we have a fruit orchard. And so this is going to be a great place for, uh, for creatives and artists. And we 
will also uh, be creating a sculpture park there. So sculptors who go there to work, um, if they make large pieces, can leave it there, and over time we can build up a, a sculpture park. So um, and so it's essentially a space for research, uh, you know, for uh, you know ideas exchange uh, between various practitioners. So you know what I'm interested in is the idea of culture as a whole, not just uh, the visual arts. So the the true meaning of the word culture. Um, is what I'm interested in. Um, and the way that we can uh, exchange ideas um, around the world, uh, you know, they, the social dimension of practice is very important to me. So it's not just about putting, you know, uh, beautiful objects in galleries, it's about what kind of social interventions can we make as creatives. Yeah, is that, this, uh, is, it, there's a kind of, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the the idea one of the things talking to various colleagues is that how in a self-facing organizational cultural space food is central right you don't you don't go into someone's house in the south without being offered anything and it seems as though there's been this kind of uh, uncoupling, uncoupling in the west of, of the relationship towards food <laughs> as part of the internal conversation around culture i mean restaurants have become visitor attractions in a kind of cultural formation, but this is much this this is this is a different space of food, isn't it? This well, is a different. It's also about you see, this is about infrastructure development. It's about yeah. economic development. You know, um, there was no access to the farm. I built a three-kilometer road to provide access. Right. So this is also about empowerment. Now we see many migrants uh, trying to cross um, cross the sea to come here. Now, of course, you know, naturally, most people don't want to actually leave their place of residence, but if they don't have economic opportunities close to them, then they will try to, you know, they will try to travel elsewhere. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but, you know, it's important that where possible, you know, it's possible to, uh, it's important to support economic development where people are. And also, to, to save the environment, uh, huge amounts of food are actually imported into Nigeria. But actually, you know, it is possible to make a small contribution to food sustainability locally. Uh, part of the problem, it's not that people don't grow things, that the infrastructure is quite difficult. So mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, lots of the food goes to, you know, go to waste. Uh, because it's taken too long to get them from farm to market. Um, and so things spoil that way. And so this is, um, you know, the, in the scheme of things, you know, it's a very small project. You know, the, the farm is only 54 acres. But, you know, it's an example of what one could actually do uh, in terms of real kind of social interventions. That's, well, that's, that's really, sorry, sorry Buck, that's really taken us to um, a stage of exploring the social and the political and I, we're, we're pretty much at time I'm ready to go to Q&A but what I'd like to suggest is we carry on with this theme and to encourage um, oh gosh 150 people in the room do send your questions in there's a great one from Tas Dahmani which I'll come to in a few minutes but if I can encourage people to put that in and meantime yes Mark I think you were going to pick up the social and political implications well, I, I just, that, and your own interventions. Yeah no I was just going to think about this in terms of that idea of example really in terms of leading that that space and it's interesting that it's come not from a kind of um you know, pure, a purely entrepreneurial aspect in terms of maybe thinking about doing things differently as a social enterprise. It's come from a kind of creative lens, right? And I think what, 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 uh, what's interesting for me within the kind of decolonial kind of questions is that we often use the term practice, this idea of not practice, praxis, this idea that everything's kind of embodied and the idea of bringing the food and the, and the place to stay and the idea of the thinking and you know the, the farm the nurturing the growing the understanding the closeness to a kind of you know um place of a place of where you know i don't even like the term a place of nature if you like where where we are close to the environment can only be if you like a, a place of decolonial work at work 
right? Because I think people often get very confused about what we mean by this idea of a kind of decolonizing practice. So I think this is for me a really, the reason why I think this conversation is so important in terms of where you're situated is that it takes a place of making and sustenance and the environment into a kind of full circle where they can literally feed off each other and or grow intellectually, physically, environmentally. And it creates a place as if you like, where people can feel as though that they can have a home, a place of being without necessarily culture being done to them, that they are in the making of culture. And I think that's so important to kind of get to a point where we encourage people to be part of the making of culture rather than it being a kind of consumable, if you like, something you go to pay for and being. And I think that for me is the decolonial praxis at work. Yeah, but also the, the exchange aspect is absolutely fundamental. So if you bring somebody from Europe who doesn't know much about Africa and they actually engage with people there in terms of exchanging ideas, so you don't have one way traffic, you know, people go there to actually learn and, you know, uh, understand better. Um, I think also in terms of kind of global misunderstandings and conflicts, you know, conflict resolution is actually extremely important that we start to have that true exchange of knowledge, which will then lead to respect. Um, it's not simply about us coming to, to Europe to learn. You know, it's about people from the rest of the world also going to Africa and to actually learn. And, you know, what the foundation is doing is to actually create an infrastructure for that kind of exchange to actually happen. There are, there's, there's real live comment and evidence of that. The comment from Professor Lucy Alter there, huge thank you, Yinka. Um, Art and the Environment Residency Programme has secured two places for UAL postgraduates to do residencies in your venues at Lagos and the farm. So there's a lot of appreciation there of that infrastructure. Earlier on, we were uh, comments from Rachel Cockburn, also Essie Dadsey. Just a lot of appreciation, Yenka, of your work with a couple of questions, um, practical ones. How can people access some of the earlier work? And then a question uh, which we can put we can put links in the chat, uh, I'm sure will appear in a moment. Um, and also a question about why do you think that the photographic work is less well known and the other work was more picked up? Well, I mean, you know, that, that could possibly be a factor of the market, I don't know, um, um, you know, but I, I think that a lot of that work I did also, perhaps I did earlier in my career, um, you know, and then my interests have kind of, you know, continue to move on, um, you know, so I guess people tend to be interested in the thing that I'm doing right now. That could also be another issue. Okay, and then a question, uh, both of you might be interested in it, but it's initially phrased for you, Yenka. So beyond the UK, uh, Nigeria axis of this work, how how do you find other triangulations to make what um, uh, the questioner Daryl Chapel uh, talks of as a truly international perspective? Well, I mean, I think well, if you're if you're uh, a London-based artist with uh, you know, I work with galleries in Hong Kong, in Australia, um, in New York, in South Africa. You know, I've got galleries in all of those places and I show in all of those places and I'm constantly going to all of those places to have dialogue. And the, uh, the residency in Nigeria is actually giving me platform to bring people from Asia, uh, all of the places I work uh, to bring people from South Africa, North America, South America, you know, so, and, you know, I've created a platform deliberately within Africa not London, you know, within Africa to actually bring people uh, because that's a, a much more unique space that I don't think that the world has had a um, proper dialogue with. And it's a kind of, it's, a timely, it's also a timely reminder that that dialogue should and could happen 
with not with ease, but with with pressing urgency, I would suggest. Otherwise, that idea of respect and knowledge exchange will always be left into a kind of tourist idea of you know importing ideas or exporting ideas into a kind of London centric or Eurocentric space. And it's also the ideas once the, for me those ideas once they're bedded or once they're ex, once they're allowed to thrive within the farm and within the the um, residency program can then begin to circulate more as well. So I think it is. I look at I look at the residency program through the lens of some of the work that we've done at Autograph as well, and I've always liked this idea of being satellite, projecting things out, as well as just receiving. And I think there's all that that then changes the dialogue about what you're making and how you're projecting it out. And I think the farm for me is a classic example of taking on the idea that things can be both received and then projected out of. So that those ideas are reciprocal and reset and received in a reception-like way. Yes, and also I did not want to exclude the idea of the local, and that's mm -hmm. where the farm comes in. You know, I think that you know local people are engaged in in working there, in you know producing things there, in engaging with what we're trying to do there, and also I also want to acknowledge actually the project we are doing with Lucy Otter through University of the Arts, uh, Arts and the Environment. I think it's very important. And of course, you know, Autograph, we're going to be working with you guys too on, on bringing people uh, to Nigeria. And I don't see what we're doing here as, uh, as just uh, two buildings in, in Nigeria. I see this as a catalyst for projects that are way, way bigger beyond the physical buildings that we've built. Yeah. I think the, there's a lot there's a lot to pray. sorry mark were you about to no it's keys isn't it it's it's key i mean it's a bit i mean to tie it into a kind of to tie it into a university context as well they're kind of keys to opening up knowledge aren't they that's what the university should be right it's not just i think for, i think to, within the kind of context of you know fee paying students if you like they're kind of given something and hopefully they they, 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 they there's a space where they uh it, it's where, where, they, where they kind of go away with something but it's uh, for me I, I was very lucky to be involved in kind of a higher education when you know you got a student grant and fees were paid for and it felt as though there was a place of exchange within that within that that is very different now a place of learning a place where things can fall over a place of inquiry not necessarily about getting getting a result but it was it was really about getting an experience where which could change you hopefully I mean it was an escape from for some people for working class people university was an escape to, to a, a new identity for you know diasporic people university was an escape to a new identity as well for you know for, for feminists for queer folk you know, places of thinking where where you could interact with and change and become the multiple selves that we all are in that space not these uni uni creatures that just walk on the planet i.e african black you know straight queer class ridden gendered the idea that there's a place you know that you've built in lagos that is facilitating this multi this multiverse of conversation around the environment around identity around the making the creating the farm the sustainability is an important example i think not just in terms of the uh, creative industries but also in terms of what some of the university models might learn about what pedagogic direction can flow in yeah no, absolutely you know and i'm hope i'm hoping that there will be many more collaborations with academic institutions and academics you know we're not actually restricting this to um you know to artists as such we also want to have people doing research uh, mm -hmm. also because it's essentially about knowledge exchange you know, professors who might want to do residency for a month, uh, who uh, who can uh, bring some some skills uh, to exchange, and you know, possibly exchanges between universities out there and universities here. You know, we want to be a catalyst uh, for many many dialogues. Uh, that's really what what the foundation would like to to be. And but you know both of you have achieved so much in creating that culture. I mean, listening to you both, um, Mark, one of our newest professors uh, at the university, Yinka already collaborating with um, 
uh, the the um, unit that Lucy Ort is uh, developing. One might think as an audience, oh, great, we're really on the right path, and hopefully we are. But I'm I'm aware as well, Yinka, that that you possibly Mark to have got quite. Um, significant criticisms of the way that some universities and some ways of thinking seem kind of stuck in a in, in a victim mentality or a particular way of thinking which isn't pointing in the direction you two are emphasizing so I, ju I just wanted to take that the temperature of that uh, unless we think that the universities have kind of got this sorted out um, well I mean you know I can take that as a you know, I'm not a professor within the university, you know, I'm a kind of independent voice. So um, I feel that, um, you know, I can just make my own observations about, uh, you know, about post-colonial theory and decolonization. And those things are um, extremely crucial, but my own, my own dream would be uh, not, of course, you know, some of what has been done to us historically, it's very important that we highlight those and we challenge those, but also to prepare people for skills beyond uh, those atrocities and actually teach people empowerment skills so that they can actually uh, manage in the world and have real practical skills to improve um, their own situations, uh, both in terms of profile within society and um, you know, e uh, economic resources to empower themselves. You know, this is kind of very basic uh, skills. And I think if we don't, uh, we have to twin the history and the historical knowledge with uh, empowerment skills. So that would, be my, that would be my criticism that it doesn't seem to me based on my own experience of being a student that you know, a lot of my own empowerment skills I had to acquire after I'd left university. But I think it would be a good idea, you know, and that could be done in many ways. That could be done through mentoring programs uh, with people uh, who are successful, who could be role models. Uh, that could be done through, um, you know, pl placements uh, as well. Uh, because I, I don't think that people should be leaving university uh, feeling that they know the history, but they don't know how to go about empowering themselves. That that's about come to you in a moment, Mark. But that's actually a very tidy answer to an anonymous question from a questioner of Nigerian heritage, who's just completing their masters in creative producing and asking, how do I combine this to actively contribute and impact change? Um, and I, yeah, as a lot of praise for you both as well in her comment. Um, Mark, did you want to speak to this? Or I can... Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, you know, there's, there's a certain sense that it would be really important to kind of, we, we talked about keys before, but to kind of unlock the door, you know, unlock the chamber, really, the kind of psychological, physical chamber. I mean, we, I mean, I'm very, I've always been influenced by the work of, um, you know, people like Franz Fanon and how the psychology of blackness works on the, on the mind, how, it become, you know, burdened with representation. We, we, we've spoke about this a lot in the 80s and 90s, uh, particularly through the work of, you know, people like Governor Mercer, Paul Gilroy, Bell Hooks, and, and many other great scholars, Toni Morrison, fictional writings that, un, that, that allow freedom of expression to kind of, um, to be part of our, our making rather than being shackled into the kind of corridors of uh, where people think you belong, right? in terms of what you have, where, where you should be inquiring. I think one of the things that, one of the things that's important when Yinka talks about mentoring and, um, and sharing ideas, if they can happen within, within the institute, people often find that outside of the institution because the, in the institutions themselves often don't have people that can read the work that someone's maybe trying to do or trying to put across. And they're kind of chaperoned into places where they, they feel, in terms of the power exchange, people feel comfortable that they can read the thing that's been presented to them. So I think that, I think people, I think there needs to be a kind of um, a quiet discomfort with the relationship so that both parties are learning and sharing in that space. I quite like the idea, 
when Yinka was talking about academics going into a residency place, whether it's his or somewhere else, that ideas can be put to rest for a little while so that new things can grow outside of that. And sometimes the environment can make that happen. You don't know why you're thinking about something else, but the things that you're around physically and emotionally kind of help shape something else or, or create a nurturing space for something else to emerge. And I think there's a, there's a huge degree of um, protect. You, people talk about protected characteristics. I'm doing our national portfolio application for the Arts Council at the moment, so it's within there. But there's too many people feel very comfortable within protected characteristics as well. They want a label and they want a place. And I don't think change really lives in that space. Change for me lives in those who are prepared to act and say and do and make change real. Thanks, Mark. And I mean, the dangers of essentialism in, uh, all the, um, implied in what, what you well, just as I, as said. I said the, so, you know, micro and macro essentialisms. And yep. you, ha you have to have a conversation with yourself about that space. And it can't be comfortable. Thank you. Questions here, um, Yenka, for your uh, about your experience of collaboration, um, whether that was always an impulse for you or whether you actively developed a collaborative approach, and if so, what was it? And from Lorraine, Lauren, rather, Le Goff, um, asking specifically, have you collaborated with costume makers in the works? Yes. Um, well, I mean, I think that, you know, my... My whole studio is about collaborations. You know, I I have a number of you know I work with a number of costumiers. Uh, I work with photographers. I work with sculptors. I work with um, you know when you I mean I, when I started my career I was I was a painter, so I just did all that myself. Um, but as things evolve and you get more popular and you're like you know running twenty shows. Uh, at any one time, then of course you have to be you you in effect you're you're basically running a studio. You know, it's it's back to kind of old-fashioned Renaissance studio type uh, thing. So you're in effect, uh, you know, so yes, yeah, so the way my studio works is um I I when I have a project, we have I have design meetings and I call in all the different skills involved. And so my job is basically, you know, I'm like a, I'm like, I'm basically like an architect's office. You know, I basically design the projects and then the various skills within the practice execute. And that's how I've worked for the past, um, you know, 30 years or so. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that also answers the question from Natasha Bonellam, um, some of that area. Um, a lot of praise. Um, Coming in, um, uh, Professor Andrea Zimmerman and others giving you know personal testimony really to the impact of your practice on the development of their ideas. Um, and yeah, it, Maureen Salmon um, emphasizes the need to learn from Africa throughout the research and knowledge exchange relationships and, and she leads many of those conversations that reflection learning from africa um reversing the roles if you like any any reflections from you we've, we've got about five six minutes more for questions than i'll need to round up but that feels like a central one um sorry can you say that again uh Yes, um, Maureen Salmon, um, among others, uh, talks about learning from Africa, reversing the flow, if you like. Have you, any, any reflections on how that's best done, or what what's next to well, continue already, to build that? that? That's already that's already happening through Bonner Boy, Whiskey, um, Afrobeat. You know, like African culture um, is kind of huge. It's interesting that through popular culture. Um, you know, people are actually, you know, learning the vibes or understanding Africa, but, you know, on a more, on a more serious note, I mean, that starts from popular culture, but actually, you know, imagine the possibilities if people could actually go to Africa and actually interact and learn more. And you see also with social media, we're not too, we're not too far away from each other now. You know, I think it's just a case of people have been enabled to actually be on the ground and have that real 
person-to-person -person exchange of ideas. And, um, and I think that's how development happens. You know, that's how we actually, that's how creativity happens. You know, it's about rubbing off each other, you know, getting ideas from each other. And I just don't feel it's been historically, it's not happened enough in the other direction. It's always been the South going north, you know, which, and I think that must change. That's well overdue to change. Thank you. And I'm thinking, Mark, of your award for outstanding services to photography and the, some of the discussion citation around that, that you've really helped this happen or helping this happen. Is there anything you want to say about the, I, I autograph? Think of, I, I think one of the things I realised actually is that, you know, the history of photography from, the, from speaking about my work in particular, that the history of photography always felt uncomfortable, always felt slightly, you know, um, same, same, same old names popping up or, or versions of that, you know, whether it's photojournalism or whether it's creative making in that space. So by, that, by being fortunate enough to spend time in places with Afro, with Afro communities from Uruguay to Brazil to, 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 to West Africa, you're able to see a practice, a history of photography, nearly as old as, as old as the medium itself, vibrantly being made. And I watched, to be honest, the French cultural institutions embrace it in a very particular French way, institutions like Revue Noir, for example, and the work that Simon Ninjami was doing, really pushing forward and developing, if you like, the first photography festival in Bamako, Mali, 1994, 93, 94, was an outstanding moment of learning for anybody and everybody who, as Yinka said, <laughs> went there. You could go to the studios, you could see the work, and you just had a complete reset of understanding who's making what and what the work photography is doing in those particular cultures. So that's the, and the influence then, the influence of say, Sadu Keita's work or Malik Sadi Bey's work on contemporary fashion photography is still in flux as we speak now. So it's making those things that are there clearly alive and accessible through amplifying them in the right cultural channels and offering scholars the opportunity to do that work both there, here, and here, there. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I agree with that. And, um, you know, yes. So, you know, for me, it's, uh, you know, what we're doing is just the, it's the beginning of the conversation. You know, um, it's, it's work, you know, I'm hoping to, that this leads to many more uh, projects, you know, um, developed elsewhere. Yeah. A few comments coming in um, about the long-term future for gas in Lagos and for this kind of work. Any thoughts on that? Securing a long-term future and allied to that, I suppose the question from Samina Zahir. What workforce changes in the UK do you think are needed for us to see more diverse work, such as Yenkes and the work curated and shown by Mark at Autograph? So long-term future and how do we see and protect more of it? Well, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, guest artist space in Lagos, Gas uh, Foundation, we are uh, in the process. One of the biggest things we want to do now is to actually raise an endowment uh, so that we, uh, we continue to uh, support the staff that manage it going forward. So, you know, if we put in an endowment, we can, the interests hopefully will then support our staff. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, so my aim is to, uh, in the next two years, to have a serious fundraising campaign uh, so we can build that, uh, build that endowment so that we, I don't want this to be a one-off project that then will stop receiving funding. So, and we're, you know, we're on our way to, to building that endowment and, you know, with determination and focus, um, we can do that. Um, I'm a very strong believer in, in possibilities, you know, so and so, yes, and, and uh, the building is very much owned uh, by myself. Um, so that future is secured. They won't be kicked out of the building because I built it. Um, you know, and I think that, um, yes, so, you know, I, I think that's, um, you know, we will, we will continue with, with people's support and interests. 
I think um, for me, cultural institutions, um, they reflect the people that run them. So if we want to see spaces change, then the demographic of those institutions have to change. Like Yinka, I think one of the things we've, we've all understood is that it, it's about what kind of power bases can you build? What kind of foundations can you put in? And I think if we can create an environment where, you know, young, bright or, or young in terms of career or interested in terms of, you know, places of difference in learning are in and supported within, you know, cultural institutions, curators given a chance at Tate, young ones from here to do things that they are interested in. If the dice can be rolled slightly different in terms of accessibility, and we can, if you like, unprivileged some of the those that sit in entitled places, I think we could be in for a very dynamic and interesting future. Thank you, thank you so much. That's a, that's a great place to pause this uh, at the moment. Um, Mark and Yinka, thank you so much for such an sort of in, insightful and provoking discussion. I've got some of your phrases resonating that I'll be reflecting on. Uh, of the great historical collections you talked about, we're absent and yet embodied. Mark talked about the quiet discomfort, staying close to that, affecting change. And then the way that, Yenke, you've signaled your um, embrace of absurdity and play to reinvent and navigate from the polarized um, victim perpetrator um, histories that we often uh, inherit. Thank you, uh, everybody. Um, our 150 guests or so come and going through this session. Thank you for joining us today. We really look forward to continuing and deepening this conversation. Um, we're part way through the University of the Arts London's month long research season program of events. Uh, there are plenty of questions still in the chat. Sorry to those of you that we couldn't get to this time. They'll be summarized a lot of the, the content, but I'll leave you with this, this question. How do we begin to do, divert attention to the South without risking the potential for extraction as opposed to having spaces of knowledge production in the South recognized as generative? So kind of structural thinking there. Um, and that theme, the, the best thing I can do now, because we've just got just a minute more, is to um, signpost you to our research, ongoing research season. And there, there are lots of events coming up um, on uh, this theme of the decolonial, there's decolo decolonizing performance at Wimbledon College of Art on the 15th. On the 16th, we've got the transnational fashion um, and its challenges discussion on the 28th. Um, we've got uh, exploring intersectionality from a diasporic and feminist perspectives. And then um, looking at what universities mostly do in terms of teaching. And we've got a 24 hours on earth, what on earth is called the um, research into teaching event. So um, many thanks to our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor David M. Barr, to Park, the research centre where Mark's based, um, there, Brigitte Leutenwa and Oisin Davis, to our, um, all our support staff technically, Tommaso has been helping us with the AV. A particular thanks though, go to Lynn Finn, who's such a key figure in the uh, creation and curation of our research season. Uh, she's from, a very, she's a very important person now, UAL uh, research management team. So I hope you'll join us for many more events to come. Thank you very much for making time. And I'm sure from the tone of the conversations coming back and the questions, I know that we will be continuing to deepen um, our work in this area. Uh, Yinka Mark, thank you so much. Thank you, and thanks for hosting us. And Yinka, thanks very much for joining the conversation, and may they continue. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure.